Hansa, everyone. Uh, I'm just so delighted to be uh, invited here today and to, uh, yeah, Jerry, thank you, uh, to uh, be spending some digital space with you all uh, this uh, afternoon. Um, what I thought I would do before I dive into what I'm uh, here to share um, in terms of who we are at Nehawin and what we do and how we can help, uh, I wanted to start with an opening prayer. Um, now, the reason why we do this from an Indigenous perspective, kind of the function that this serves, um, is taking a moment to just pause and reflect and intention set. So really think about, you know, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Why is it important? Um, and also, you know, what are those important values that we wish to have kind of guiding um, whatever it is we're about to do? Um, so what I'll be doing uh, shortly is I will just be saying a few words, um, but I really, really encourage everyone to pray in their own way or whatever's comfortable for you. Um, I often say if that's stretching, getting some water, um, doing some breathing, or even holding your cat, that's totally fine. Um, so without uh, any further ado, I will take my glasses off, which means that it's praying time, uh, and then uh, I'll say a few words. I want to give thanks, Creator, uh, for this wonderful opportunity to gather with such lovely hearts and minds um, today to uh, kind of seek further understanding and, and sort of ways that we can move forward as that community of communities um, in the wake of a lot of uh, really challenging things in a very turbulent time. I think that this connection that we're building now and uh, the desire and action that we're invested in, um, in, in pursuing, you know, what to do, I think that's going to really carry us through um, this time that we're in right now. So I'm just super thankful to be uh, a part of this group that's gathered here. Um, and as well, I would like to call in uh, you, Creator, to come sit with us today, as well as the, the ancestors of all those that are gathered here. So um, our friends and our family and our loved ones, um, invite them to come sit with us so that they can help us um, learn and be together in a good way with our hearts and our minds open. As well, um, I'd like to call in that spirit, uh, once again, that Gregory mentioned of Tatawao, um, to always remind us of the importance of making space for one another um, so that we can feel connected, safe, um, and excited to be on this very uh, wonderful journey that we're on of being in better relationship with each other and also the world around us, that which we hold most dear. So, hi, hi, kenanaskomatan, aho. Wonderful. Holy, I can't see it all. Okay, good. We're good to go. Uh, so um, just to kind of expand a little bit more on that, once again, very generous introduction. Uh, Tansi, everyone. My name is Hunter. Uh, I'm the director of story and half the sibling team here at Nehawin. Um, my background is in acting and performance. And uh, with that, you know, I'm really passionate um, about connecting people to the larger and very exciting stories that they're a part of so that they can feel rooted during turbulent times, kind of like that, the, the ones that we're in right now. Um, and a little bit about who I'm from. Um, I am uh, Sagewenawak or Woodland Cree um, from the Sucker Creek Cree First Nation on my dad's side. Um, and uh, yeah, from Treaty 8, so represent there. Uh, and as well on my mom's side, um, I'm Polish and French by way of Israel and New York. So with that, there's a really fascinating um, Jewish lineage that I'm just so thankful to be able to explore and learn more about. Um, so overall, you know, I'm just so grateful to have those histories and those stories as well as tasty, tasty foods um, with me as a part of my life. Um, yeah, and uh, as mentioned, uh, my sister and I run Nehawin, and I know that I'll be talking about it shortly. Um, that's just a, a social enterprise that offers sustainable and practical Indigenous-based solutions to help with organizations and their specific diversity and inclusion goals. Um, and the way that we do this um, is what we'll basically be talking about today. Um, we do this with a storytelling and education approach that's informed by a treaty lens. Um, or what it is to be in relationship from an Indigenous perspective. And that is hopefully um, kind of how, what we'll be diving into today. Um, so basically what that looks like, it's when we provide sessions, you know, not unlike this one where we share what we know, um, invite conversation, um, and try to shift minds and hearts towards a new and more inclusive narrative. Uh, much of our knowledge sharing, uh, it centers around history, understanding Indigenous world views, it's very important, um, and interesting things happening in Indigenous circles, uh, such as conversations around data sovereignty, artistic practices, uh, monetary policy, as, where, as well as um, environmentalism. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit more about, you know, our approach to this work that we do. 
Um, so in true Nehewak or uh, Cree fashion, uh, I wanted to start with a story. Um, and it actually comes from uh, one of my favorite books of all time, uh, Long Life, Honey in the Heart by Martin Prechtel, um, an American author and educator. And I just find that the poetry and, and insights and ideas that are just throughout this whole book, it's amazing. So if you have the chance, read this. It's one of those things where you read and then you're like, whoa, whoa let me read that again. And then you just kind of lay down thinking about that. Um, it's just a great book. But anyways, so this, this author, uh, Martin, uh, he was raised in um, or on a, a Pueblo reservation in New Mexico, uh, which is um, indigenous, uh, and he has indigenous and Swiss ancestry. So really interesting human. Um, and basically, as a young man in 1970, he traveled uh, to Guatemala, where after a year, um, he settled in a village near Lake Atitlan uh, among Mayan people. Really exciting. Um, but in this book, uh, he shared about his uh, experience in understanding uh, how to be a part of their communities. Um, and, uh, and it's just, it, it's so, it's so funny because he was telling uh, in the story about when he was uh, creating these small paintings um, to sell uh, to uh, the villages that he'd been traveling to and around. Um, and uh, basically throughout that process, he says that, you know, he made, he made quite a, a good amount of money through that. Um, but he felt like it wasn't fair to be taking money from these, you know, pretty poor uh, villagers. Um, so one day he decided to, you know, give that money back because he was like, I don't need this. This feels weird. Um, and to his shock and dismay, um, he was literally chased away um, from those villages uh, when he tried to give their money back. Um, and, and the communities were just so insulted. Um, and he was really shocked about why that happened in the first place. He thought he was doing something really good. Um, and it was explained to him by a, a local who happened to be mentoring him at the time, um, that the idea of being in community with others is to get so entangled in debt that no normal human can possibly remember who owes what um, and, and how much and to whom. Um, and this uh, mentor goes on and says that in our business dealings, we keep close tabs on all exchanges. Um, but in sacred dealings, we think just like nature, where all is entangled and deliciously confused, dedicated to making the earth flower in a bigger plan of spirit beyond our mind and understandings. So I just love that quote. And once again, that highlights just the, the beautiful poetry and, and nutrient dense ideas that are in this book and, and, and what he explores. Um, and in Nehiao or in uh, Cree traditions, um, those of, of, of my people, the Nehiwak, um, we think of this delicious confusion, the really wonderful idea that Martin talks about, um, as taking place in a great circle where we each have a place and are connected to one another. Uh, as is the case with much of our work um, at Nehewin, um, we're often brought into spaces uh, because there's an imbalance in that circle, um, even fractures. And this isn't just an imbalance between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples, um, but among all peoples who share these lands. Um, and we really do believe that um, that connection to land, being in that beautiful relationship, connection to place as well, connection to our uh, grand story within this great circle is really a wonderful starting place for good relations um, among all those that live here, um, including everything as well. Um, and that's why an overarching goal um, with in all the work that we do has been understanding how we might help those in our communities. Um, and right now it's, it's mostly non-Indigenous organizations um, back into that circle among all of our relations. Um, and there I'm talking about being in relationship with the land where people come from, uh, where they're working, um, as well as the, the wonderful diversity of relationships with people um, that we have here, the different communities that they're working with um, or serving. Uh, as well as the animals and that those, those non-human relations that exist um, as well. Um, and uh, the question really is, you know, how do we help uh, others understand this key truth 
that from an indigenous perspective seems so self-evident, you know, that all people are a part of this really delicious confusion of creation, um, this great circle. So when we, um, my sister and I, when we reflect on the Nehiwewen or Cree language um, and ceremony, um, it seems that um, this isn't only our challenge as contemporary peoples, both indigenous and non-indigenous in terms of really understanding that relationship, um, but it, it is the ultimate challenge. Uh, you know, uh, often our, our most sacred ceremonies, our teachings, and ways of being are all geared towards trying to answer this creation, uh, or this question rather, of how we find and continually create balance in ourselves and all those that we are in relationship with. And I know for me personally, just um, exploring a lot of these indigenous ideas, um, these really wonderful tools that can really um, enrich my work, not only as a consultant, um, but as an actor and a storyteller as well. Um, I, I, I remember I was talking with this one elder and I was like, "How? Wh why is this so difficult to maintain? Um, this is really hard. And he said, yeah, you know, this stuff is difficult and it's, and it's hard to keep in our minds because we as people have horrible memories. Um, that's why our stories, our ceremonies, and our songs are just so important because they are mechanisms, ways in which we can remind ourselves of these really crucial ideas that can help us live a good life. And uh, yeah, luckily for us with thousands of years to do this cultural work and to build on that, our ancestors actually figured a lot of stuff out. Um, and they passed it down to us to live and share with all peoples who share these lands. Um, that's something that my sister and I are really passionate about doing and doing that um, in a respectful, generous and warm way. Um, and like the American physicist uh, Richard Feynman says of nature, he has this wonderful quote um, that she only uses the longest threads to weave her patterns so that each small piece of her fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry. Um, once again, a beautiful quote. Um, we find that that's actually the same thing in the, in the case with indigenous knowledges. Um, and the fabric made of the longest threads that we know for all peoples who share these lands um, really is to us that spirit and intent of our treaties or what it is to be in relationship from that indigenous perspective. So that, um, that just before I go on any further, I just wanted to be really clear that when I talk about treaties, um, I'm not necessarily talking about Western treaties. Um, so Western treaties are often that written static legal document that I think we'd all be pretty much familiar with. Um, you know, if you're a big history nerd like I am, wonderful example would be the Treaty of uh, Versailles um, right after World War I, or if you're a bigger nerd, um, Treaty of Westphalia. Um, so those are examples of those uh, Western or non-Indigenous treaties that are typically a written static legal document where there's a clear winner and a clear loser after a conflict. Um, with Indigenous understandings of treaty, totally different. These are dynamic, ongoing processes that change over time, um, that have renewal processes for ways in which we can renew um, and align ourselves with that pursuit or that goal of the relationship that we are pursuing. Um, and once again, with that, they're preventative of conflict. So they're done typically to avoid conflict um, or in the lead up to it. Um, and they look a bunch of different ways. Um, and that, yeah, that, that's often known as that spirit and intent of treaty. Uh, so what's great is when you look at Treaty 6, for example, you know, there is that non-Indigenous side, that Western treaty that we can read in that written document, but there's a whole wealth of stories and ideas and frameworks and tools within that non uh, that indigenous side of treaty as well um, that idea of good relations of understanding of that process uh, a practice almost of walking together in a good way um, and from our people um, Nehewak, um, our word in the Cree language um, for treaty is this really fantastic word um, that you can see on the screen there it's called Nisto um, and it's often translated um, as uh, meaning um, to understand or understanding. Um, but that word, if we were to get really etymological here, um, that word understanding um, has the etymology of the old English word understanding, um, which is to just 
comprehend, um, grasp the idea of, or probably literally stand in the midst of, um, which is actually just a sliver of Nistar Tamoin's full meaning from that Cree or Nehalak perspective. Um, so what I wanted to do is just look at this word for its morphemes um, or the smallest linguistic units of a word which can't be meaningfully broken down any further. So I almost like thinking of morphemes as like, you know, what are those building blocks um, that make up this word, that shape the idea? Uh, what, are, what is its foundation? Um, so if we were to look at this word, Mr. Tomlin, what we would find is at the very end of the word, we have uh, a morpheme that you may be familiar with um, if you're calling in from Edmonton or in Treaty 6 territory, um, which is the win, the win part of a word in the Cree language. That is, uh, it typically means um, the act of. And what it does is it makes that word, it turns it into a process or a verb, uh, a way of doing something. Um, and it's really, really common in, in Nehiwe Win. Once again, you can hear that even in the word language. It's a verb. It's what you do. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's really cool because uh, what's, what's fascinating is that the, the Cree language is, is very verb-based. And I'll do a quick sidebar here. Um, so, for example, we wouldn't say that the, uh, the table or, or the wall is brown. Um, we would actually say the table is being brown, um, which is interesting because um, what it sounds Sounds like is almost that table is in the process of becoming itself, that it's alive, that it's animate. Um, and that's really awesome to look at because we can say the same thing for what it is to be, you know, uh, 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 in community. It's, it's, a, it's a relationship. It's a, it's a process. It's something that you do rather than just a label that you stick on. Um, so once again, with indigenous languages, they are verb based um, because everything is dynamic. Everything is a process that requires effort. Um, and, uh, and that's really important. Um, then if we're to look at the middle of the word, um, we'll find that morpheme tamo. Um, and tamo typically uh, refers to direction or intentionality, a very specific way of doing something. Um, so uh, the, the, the last part of this is, uh, is a word that, that for those of you who may have taken some Cree lessons, I know I have, um, this is actually probably going to be one of the more familiar words. It's probably one of the first couple of words that you learned, um, which is nisto. And that translates literally into the number three. Um, and I remember I was so confused as to why this random number three is in this very important word, you know, that, that we use synonymously with treaty. What, like three, what does that mean? Um, and I was thinking, well, you know, shouldn't it, it match the, the parties in the, in the treaty or, you know, um, even kind of mirror two groups coming together to become one? Why is there three? It doesn't make sense. Um, so I actually had to, to ask some elders and, uh, and I had a lovely breakfast with one um, and I, I did that research and, and I discovered in that conversation that three actually refers to the three parts that constitute understanding between peoples and the order that they should be done in. So it's actually a framework um, and a process. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so the, the process that it's encouraging is um, first recognizing um, that, that we are all connected and really learning that we share that interconnectedness, um, that we exist almost in that vast interconnected web of all things, that there really is no true separation between yourself and everything else. So that's the, the foundational idea here, that first level of understanding. And then it's said that after you, you recognize that and are present with that, then you can move on to that second level of understanding or that second step in this journey, um, which is learning about ourselves, you know, us as individuals, that journey inward. Um, really getting at that idea that you yourself, you know, are also a delicious confusion. So knowing yourself is key to properly comprehending your specific place in that interconnected web. You know, being aware of who you are, who do you come from, what are the values that you hold like most dearly, and, and what is it that you're, you're pursuing in your life. Um, and after you go through that second level, then you can get to that third part of this, this whole concept, which is learning about the other um, and, and the very difficult process of attempting to grasp the full complexity of the reality of there being others 
many others who are unique, whole, and separate, and connected with you, but of, of course, you know, ultimately growing in their own way, and ultimately sovereign, and going towards their own future. Um, so that's what I love about this whole um, concept of Nistotamu, and it's the framework that, that goes through different levels of understanding, and it's a process, and, it, and it's just, it's really beautiful, and, and it, these Indigenous ideas and words, even in our language, they're just rich with meaning and really helpful tools that we can use um, for the work that we're doing. Um, so with this understanding, we can see that Mr. Tomlin, once again, it doesn't just translate into understanding. Um, it translates more accurately <laughs> into the intentional act of relationshiping, um, which I just love if we were to translate it directly. So um, applied to our time, we can use that Nisto uh, framework to really conceptualize navigating back into that into um, the, the circle uh, as, a, as a journey, really, as an ongoing process of understanding our connection to all things, understanding ourselves. And then once that's achieved, we can start to um, engage and understand with each other. It's that process that we, we should enter into to be in balance. Um, but of course, you know, the map isn't the territory. Um, so the exact steps of how to do this navigating um, and even the tools and teachings to help guide us can be challenging um, on our own to really um, apply, to think about, to, to transpose to who we are. Um, and as much as my sister and I want to, um, we actually can't prescribe a set of rules and steps for all of us to follow. Um, because that idea of uh, shifting into that practice of um, relationshiping, um, that is behavior change. Uh, it's really important to recognize that because what we know about um, from all the literature on behavior change, um, and, and it's something that we probably have all experienced in our lives when we're trying to do something better or differently, um, is that um, any change, any behavioral change that's incongruent with the self or in alignment with who you are, it just won't last. And I think that's really important to know, um, especially when we think about, you know, how can we take steps towards reconciliation? Really important part of that process will be making sure that whatever it is you're doing, it is, it's coming from a place of, of, yes, I can see myself doing this and whatever it is I'm doing resonates with me. It's going to be a really key part um, to making sure that this journey, which is generational in, in nature, it's a big, big thing that we're trying to do here. Um, we can only do so much in our time. Uh, what we can do is really important um, uh, in that we need to make sure that we're creating that foundational change based off of whatever's in our sphere of influence. Um, so what we do at Naheon is we, we need to then help facilitate that behavior change by engaging, you know, with relevant stories and teachings as individuals and as a group in a way that feels real and important to each of us and our collective as a whole. And then allowing that transformation to drive action and that action to drive further transformation. Um, and this is the path and the process that we really love and that we'd like to continue to walk with all those that wish to join us um, and who feel inspired to do this work. Um, but what I wanted to do before we close is just, um, uh, and, and, and open things up for a little bit more of a discussion because I imagine there's some ideas that are popping up for folks. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about our educational offerings just so you get a sense of you know, what working with us would look like. Um, so it's, it's two main things right now. Um, it's our online webinars and our self-paced um, online course. Um, so just to provide an overview there, these webinars um, are typically anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes. Um, we find that hosting them online is a really great way to have them be um, immersive, um, to have them be um, accessible and can fit in with, with your schedules. Um, and uh, yeah, in these sessions, you know, we provide that so a solid presentational format, kind of like what I'm doing right now is I'm just sharing ideas. Um, and then we always leave space for ample discussion and opportunity to synthesize, you know, the ideas that we're talking about, either through, you know, seeking further clarification, asking questions, or just sharing what's coming up. Um, and our topics, you know, they cover everything from foundational Indigenous awareness, 
um, to more specialized topics, things that I find really exciting, like indigenous astronomy. Um, and right now, you know, our, our most popular sessions include um, a session that we call Staying Warm, a guide to allyship in action. Um, and this provides an indigenous perspective on what allyship is um, and how each organization and individual um, can navigate becoming um, a better ally using indigenous ideas. Um, so we find that to be really exciting when folks are, are kind of thinking about, hey, you know, how do I, how can I situate myself in this journey of reconciliation and beyond? Um, we find that this is a really great place to start. Um, then the next one that we find uh, folks get a lot of, out of are treaty acknowledgements, why we do them and what is next. Um, and really this dives into the significance really behind these statements um, from an indigenous perspective. So really kind of looking at, you know, why are these statements done and, and what can we gain from looking at them from that indigenous perspective? Because um, there's such a wonderful uh, um, symphony of indigenous ideas at work within that concept of uh, land acknowledgements um, and really being mindful of that uh, can make them meaningful um, and can be a really wonderful tool in that journey towards and beyond reconciliation. So. I really love that. That's a that's a big um, one for me. Um, and then the the next one. This is a, another one that we're finding folks are really interested in. Which uh, and maybe I'm just projecting. So who knows? <laughs> but uh, it's uh, above Turtle Island, exploring Indigenous histories and futures through star stories. Um, so this is basically a dive into Indigenous astronomy, um, its significance to Indigenous peoples, um, and how this can basically transform the sky above us. And I share some, some really old um, indigenous myths that are associated with constellations um, that we know um, from that Western perspective, like the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Um, and we find that it's just really a wonderful portal or entryway into learning more about, you know, the different forms of storytelling, um, the different ways of looking at storytelling as well. So I really love that one. I personally know that my introduction into really learning about indigenous ways of doing things um, was through understanding, you know, indigenous astronomy in the first place, because I had no idea that we even had an astronomy. We totally do, which was great for me because inside I'm a huge Star Trek fan. So I was really excited about that. I was like, whoa, yeah, that's cool. Um, anyways, uh, the next thing uh, before I wrap with, a, with another short story, spoiler, um, is our online courses. Um, and this is really great. This is for individuals um, and organizations looking for, you know, that self-paced option. Um, and we have this really wonderful online course. Um, it's really high quality too. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of, of the work that was done here. And what this does is it provides um, an overview of the key histories and concepts needed um, to take steps towards reconciliation. Um, it's, it's really immersive. Um, it's filled with really fun activities um, and games uh, to help with that engagement and, and uh, um, taking in and digesting of these ideas and these histories. Um, and it's also really accessible too. Uh, so, you know, the, some courses out there um, have folks needing to invest hours and hours and hours of time um, sifting through an overwhelming amount of information. You know, that's all important to know. Um, but what our course does is we really try to provide the information that you need to frame and also take those first steps um, in your, your journey and your work towards reconciliation in a way that is sustainable, um, that's practical. Um, so that you can invest the time where, where you need to and where it matters the most, which is what a lot of people are saying is in action. So once again, all of these um, educational offerings are really trying to provide that opportunity to build um, that understanding to um, sort of uh, inspire folks about this really exciting um, different world, different way of relating to um, the world in and of itself. Um, yeah, so, so all of that information um, can be found in uh, on our website, um, as well as the best way to get a hold of us. Um, so I'm going to share just in the chat here, um, a link to our website um, for you to learn more. Um, yeah, and what I wanted to do too, is sort of like on that theme of relationshiping of, of being um, in that really dynamic process um, is sort of leap off with this wonderful story. Um, from the, the really amazing book called Decolonizing Wealth by Edgar Villanueva. Um, so if you're interested, I would definitely read this book as well. 
Um, this is really important for me because it, it kind of frames um, this journey that we're all on um, and can help us kind of approach this in, in, a, in a good way, um, in a way that's, you know, gentle and kind to us, um, but that is effective and is solving, you know, some of the, the most pressing issues that we find ourselves met with. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, it's basically, you know, once upon a time, uh, there was a serpent that was just plaguing a village. And uh, the serpent had devoured many of the villagers, um, including children. Um, and everyone lived in fear of its next attack. And a flute player who is among the living decided that something must be done. Um, he packed a bundle of food and a knife and he went to the edge of the village and began playing his flute. As he expected, the music drew the serpent to him. And in one bite, the serpent swallowed the flute player. Inside the serpent's stomach, it was dark, but the flute player pulled out his knife and cut away a little of the serpent's stomach and ate it. And bit by bit, he cut away the serpent's flesh from the inside. And this went on for some time until finally the flute player reached the serpent's heart. And when he cut it out, the serpent died and the flute player crawled out of the serpent and returned to the village, bringing along the serpent's heart to show everyone so that they no longer um, had any reason to be afraid. So I really love that story and that myth. Um, and you know, of course, like all myth, myths of, of these types, there are lots of interpretations and ways of engaging with it. Um, and uh, I, I think that this is really perfect um, for our context here today. Um, you know, as a community of communities looking bravely at our past um, and present as well, and dreaming of a better future and what we need to do to achieve that. Um, and a lot of us as organizations and as individuals, um, we're gearing up to grapple with some menacing generational and deeply systemic issues um, that are preying upon our communities and those that we care about the most. Uh, and the only way to really confront it is by going to the belly of it and piece by piece with bravery and patience uh, come to the heart of it. And when we emerge from the other side, whenever that may be, really trusting that we'll be ready to take on the next challenge.